Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. Now, this is the weekly chart of silver crossed over the Dow 30. And I've drawn a couple of things in here. The first thing that I've drawn in is this uh, trend channel. This was where the Dow and silver traded really closely, kind of in lockstep, starting right here at this bottom uh, of the financial crisis. You can see that silver actually bottomed in the fall, down around that 850 price, and then the Dow turned around and, and bottomed in March. So then they kind of rose together here in this trend channel. They had a dual breakout here with silver blasting off and then crashing, and then the Dow uh, just kind of steadily going up. The big, big divergence right there, 2013. That's where the Dow continued up, and then silver just uh, fell off a cliff, basically. So that's the one we're watching. Now, the other thing here is to notice that the Dow has gotten out of the channel. It's not just gotten out of its uh, trend line, which was broken a number of days ago. But uh, it, it has gotten out of the channel as well. Silver, on the other hand, is kind of rounding its way out of this channel. I think it's going to get out uh, with a big move at some point. But there's a lot of false starts. And that's not really important because we've talked, and we're going to talk again tonight about the premiums and uh, the rolling shortages going on in, in some of the silver uh, products. So I want to take you over to the, the Dow chart, the live Dow chart, because we're down um, about 160 points right now on, on the Dow chart. So you can see the net Danny was around uh, uh, 16, uh, 16,650 or so. We're down to 16,500 hanging around uh, right there. And you can see it kind of is rolling over. Now, uh, is this a 50% correction or is it more like a Fibonacci 61.8 or whatever that number is? I don't put any stock in that. Maybe more of a two thirds uh, bounce when the real bottom, as I noted before, was down around 15,000. And so we came from about 17.5. Uh, just rough numbers, 2,500 loss, and uh, maybe about 1,500. So it went a little bit over 50%, and it now seems to be rolling over. You can see the MACD on the Dow. Uh, it it uh, had an initial plunge, of course, and then it rallied, plunged again, uh, rallied, and, and made a big spike top, uh, biggest top it's made in uh, a long time. So let's pull it out here just a little bit to see that. So you can see that MACD shows up even on the daily. And this goes, uh, actually, no, I'm sorry, that's not, let's get to the daily. So you can see on the daily uh, a big, huge spike down. Uh, actually larger than anything except for the one right before the bottom back in 2008. So the initial spike down in 2008 with the financial crisis got us down to here. And you can see a series of these. It started off with the top. One, two, three, four, five. And then it ends with the sixth. And you can see the divergence. It couldn't be clear uh, that marked the bottom. Do you see how on that spike there, we got this incredible low, and then with this lower spike here, we got a higher one? That is uh, an amazing divergence that, that marked the bottom. So are we gonna get a series of spike down, spike down, spike downs? I think so, I think we're rolling over. Um, I don't think that they're gonna keep the Dow up. And there's a lot of reasons for that. One of the reasons is I think they may just decide to raise interest rates and just do it. Um, and then just let the chips fall where they may. Uh, then again, they might uh, do a little token raise and then have a massive cratering and then introduce QE4. Who knows? Uh, no one knows the future. They probably don't even know what they plan to do yet. They keep jawboning things back and forth. So let's look at this zero hedge story. This is an interesting story. Now, just to give you some history of this, 
Zero Hedge didn't start until 2009. I was not blogging, but I was uh, commenting, message boards, doing things like that. I think my YouTube channel started in 2007, but I really didn't start posting videos seriously until about 2011. The blog started a little bit after that. But I remember in the beginning in Zero Hedge, I would go on there and post these sorts of things. And it was Zero Hedge did not cover silver at all. It was literally a blackout of the issue and uh, nothing was covered. Now they've come this far and they're actually covering the premium issue, which is very interesting because they've never talked about this before. So let's read this here. While status quo huggers are all too happy to point out gold and silver's lack of utter exuberance amid this week's carnage, perhaps they need to recomprehend the difference between a heavily manipulated paper market and the surging demand for physical precious metals that is evident in the 20 plus percent premium and rising being paid for silver bullion currently. And this is an interesting chart here. This is silver American Eagle premium over spot and they actually uh, chart the spot price and uh, the premium over spot and then they connect it to these events here and you can see that uh, with the end of QE3 we got a spike and uh, then we're on a massive spike now uh, we've got incredible premiums going on uh, next one and this is fascinating for me to see zero hedge actually cover 90 percent silver coins now you've heard me mention before I think a number of the members have also uh, given their arguments. I personally believe that uh, the 90% silver is going to be the first to go. It's going to be gone. And uh, we're going to see some stuff being gone now when we look at compare silver prices. But the, the reason I think it's going to be gone is because of that kind of panic premium that it has. Um, it has so many things going for it. It is U.S. Uh, it's uh, real money in the US, so it's protected by the laws of counterfeiting. And so if you counterfeit a round, a uh, buffalo round or something like that, make a fake one, um, what are you gonna get a lawsuit? If you counterfeit US money, um, you're in big trouble. So that's one of the advantages. Another big one, of course, is the prepper thing preppers the doom type preppers have been saying for the longest time you want to have some junk silver it's probably going to become money when the money system fails and uh, there's just there's just so many reasons so I think it's probably going to be the first thing to be gone so that's why we watch it so closely and uh, this explosion in premiums is, is pretty amazing uh, so they finish up here. One important aspect of the physical market that is often overlooked is the premium it commands over spot price. Right before the global financial crisis in 2008, the spot silver price fell as low as US dollars, $9 per ounce, whereas the price of one ounce silver eagle was around $17 on the wholesale market and even higher on the retail market. That's a price premium of 188%. That means that if you had had held 100 ounces of paper silver, you might have had to liquidate that for US $900, assuming the market was not halted for trading then. Whereas if you held 100 pieces of one ounce silver eagle coins, you would have gotten at least 1700 US dollars for them, if not more. So uh, they're giving a hat tip to Jesse's Cafe. Uh, I'm not going to be sour grapes here and say, uh, you know, finally Zero Hedge is talking about what uh, I've been talking about for years. Um, but it's great to see that this truth is finally coming out that uh, there are shortages going on and uh, it's, it's hitting in silver. Uh, it's an admission with, I don't consider Zero Hedge to be mainstream press. Um, and I don't consider it to be, you know, s mainstream alternative press. That would be, say, the Drudge Report or something like that. You don't hear Donald Trump talking about Zero Hedge. At least, I don't know, because I don't listen to him. But I've already talked about Drudge. 
I doubt if he talks about Zero Hedge. But so it's kind of second tier mainstream alternative news. It's good to see them come out and admit what's going on with the Silver Premiums. Of course, the, the main reason you go to Zero Hedge are the comments. And I'm going to take you to a link that was put in the comments here, an official explanation at Texas Precious Metals that's fascinating. But before we do that, we want to jump over and look at compare silver prices. Now, we've been watching the $100, 90% silver bag uh, for the lowest price there. And you can see it's 43%. And now Provident is the one that has the best price on that. But for the first time now, we're seeing over at Compare Silver Prices, we're seeing a lot of X's. Now, admittedly, the majority of the X's are over here on Atmex. But uh, you can see here that uh, for junk bags, Atmex is out. They got an X. Uh, Kitco, I'm sorry, did I say Atmex has the most? It's Kitco has the most X's, and uh, I don't trust Kitco as far as I can throw them. But Atmex has a couple X's. And uh, Silver.com has a couple X's, and we don't usually see that. Now, could we see these all X's? Absolutely. There could be an event tomorrow, and in the next days following, it could be all X's on this thing. So the Silver junk premiums are still very, very high, and the we're starting to see stuff disappear. So let's go over to this Texas Precious Metals statement and this is very interesting because they go into quite a bit of detail here this is their statement about their having problems with inventory it's called an important update on inventory levels dear tax metals customers I'm writing to provide you with an update on precious metals inventories we are presently out of stock on many products I want to begin by quoting an article I posted on July 8, 2015. It is important to understand how and why supply constraints occur during periods of falling prices and why precious metals premiums consequently spike. Let's use an extreme example to illustrate the nature of how the physical metals markets move. A. Let's assume the spot price of silver is $15 and subsequently falls to $10. B. Let's assume the annual average demand for physical silver is $1 billion. In this scenario, if the demand in dollar terms remains flat, the manufacturing output would need to increase by 50%. The mint would need to be would need to increase minting capacity from 66.67 million coins to 100 million coins, a huge increase. Now, let's think about this for a second here. First of all, um, we're talking, and they don't make this clear at all, we're talking about physical silver, yes, that's correct, but we're not talking about physical silver delivered on the futures market. Now, why is that important? Well, because the demand, at barring economic crashes and barring economies going into a tailspin, the demand for physical silver that's delivered on futures markets, such as the COMEX and the LBMA, is primarily silver that's used in manufacturing. That's still the bulk of silver that's purchased. I think it's 500 plus million ounces per year. Now, that silver demand is what they're talking about here. You see that? Let's assume the an annual average demand for physical silver. So, but that's not what Texas Precious Metals sells. They're not selling silver to manufacturers. They're selling silver to investors. Now, the second statement here gets more to the point. Now, if the silver spot price fell by 33% in a condensed time frame, you could be certain that demand would increase precipitously. If we assume demand in dollar terms doubles, the mint would need to increase production from 66.67 million coins to 200 million coins. What if demand triples or quadruples? You get the idea. Over the long term, the U.S. mint might be able to compensate, but certainly not in the short term. No manufacturing operation could. Manufacturing is inelastic with respect to short-term scalability. Okay, I'm going to grant them that, but 
notice that what you don't see here in this explanation is what is causing prices to fall. If demand is increasing so much that they can't deliver the product, then why are prices falling? Who's selling? Is it the miners who are mining at a loss? Are they dumping huge amounts of silver to go bankrupt faster? So they're very carefully avoiding the precious metals manipulation argument. Now, I will agree that when the price falls, demand rises. Demand rises for investors because there's a lot of stackers out there and they're growing by the day. And when they see cheap prices, they start to stack more. Now, remember, a number of people have pointed out that this is a new phenomenon. We haven't had stacking like we've had in the last, say, three to four years. And we haven't seen stacking on price drops. Uh, there would be no reason to manipulate the price if they couldn't d discourage people by dropping the price. If dropping the price caused a universal reaction of buying as much as you can, they wouldn't be dropping the price. They'd probably change their strategy and uh, run it up. So uh, it's beginning to shift, and we're starting to see that uh, wise investors like everyone on this site... Uh, looks at low prices as a stacking opportunity. So yes, demand increases, but that ignores the main question, and that is, why did the price fall in the first place? Who's selling, and why are they selling? I think we already know the answer. They're not selling silver. They're selling paper. So then they continue. Then you have the domino effect. The U.S. Mint goes on allocation, limiting supply to authorized purchasers. This supply constraint in the midst of rising demand forces dealers to raise premiums. Rising premiums on U.S. minted products induces buyers to purchase other sovereign coins like Canadian maples or privately minted products. The increase in demand for these products creates the same manufacturing constraints for these organizations that are affecting U.S. Mint. The problem compounds and, leads times, and lead times extend until demand cools, supplying, supplies increase, and the coil unwinds. These reverberations in the market are Economics 101. The physical precious metals market is minuscule relative to all other asset classes, and small shocks can create major supply shortages. Now, that's a very, very important admission, yet, yeah, and it is absolutely true that uh, the, and he's saying the physical precious metals, if you look at the silver market, minuscule doesn't even describe it. It's microscopic when we're talking about the value of other asset classes. And then he begins to go into the specifics. Supply constraints began surfacing in July at the U.S. Mint, and subsequently the Canadian Mint encountered severe manufacturing disruptions, which greatly limited the supply on gold, silver, and platinum. The recent tremors in the stock market and decline in precious metals prices have compounded the problems in the supply chain. As our loyal customers know, if we don't have a product in stock, we don't sell it. Given the recent events in the market and the supply chain, we're out of stock on many products. Please refer to the information below for the most recent information about our supplies. And then they're going to go into these supplies. So they have their rounds. And I am starting to see, I went through Atmex and searched. Uh, we are starting to see rounds uh, begin to evaporate. But uh, they say they get 20,000 rounds arriving every Tuesday. So that's quite a bit. The U.S. Mint, of course, they say they're on allocation. Silver Eagles are on allocation. They say they have 50,000 plus Silver Eagles in stock. That's that's a pretty good amount. That's, what, 1,000 monster boxes? We expect further supplies out of next week's allocation, but the volumes are presently unknown. Royal Canadian Mint supplies for the Canadian Maples remains extremely tight. Premiums have elevated by a couple of dollars uh, Perth Mint, presently there are no delays on gold coins. As of this writing, we presently have 15,000 plus s silver spiders in stock. Yeah, I, I think I know why nobody wants the silver spider. As well as 25,000 ounces of one-half ounce sister cities coins. Premiums on both coins remain normal. We expect the new 2016 silver kangaroo to arrive by late September, but we do not yet have a firm date on their arrival. Supplies for the platinum platypus, etc. 
Austrian mint. They're getting a shipment of silver uh, philharmonics, and then there's the 100 ounce bars. So, and then there's an interesting infographic here that you can look at. So that's their explanation. Generally, a pretty good explanation, but carefully tiptoes around the real issue with the shortage in, in physical silver, who's behind it, why they're doing it, and how it works out. So let's uh, finish up with the Gainesville coin year of the goat. I just did a check here. Now, Gainesville does sell things they don't have in stock, but they expect to have in stock. Uh, I assume that if you buy it and they don't get it, for some strange reason that they would refund your money. I have bought these half ounce goats from Gainesville. I received delivery on the date they said they would ship. So this one says it's shipping 9-25-2015. Uh, you can see, now when I first put this in the member chat, there were about 850, I think. Now we are down to, let's get the latest here. We're down to 459. So I'm awfully tempted on these. I'm thinking about maybe picking up a couple hundred of them. Uh, you can get them for as low as $10.71. This is going to end up being the cheap. Now, I think I got some below $10. I can't remember what they were at. But this is going to end up being, in my opinion, and this is just a guess, but this is going to end up being the cheapest half ounce Perth Lunar Series coin you're ever going to see in the $10 range. That's absolutely phenomenal. Yes, it is $339 over spot, but again, it's a Perth Lunar uh, I expect a quick double in probably one to two years on this one. So snap them up now if you haven't already, um, or I'll, I'm going to get a, the rest of them. So back to the chart, we're looking at a rolling over, in my opinion, on the Dow. I don't think this thing's done. Um, the big area, of course, that we're watching is that 14,000 level. That's going to be this top and... Uh, there's a lot of things going on with China, with Russia, and a lot of crazy things going on. But I think the stock market's going to at least going to correct down to there. And then we'll wait and see what we get and make some predictions based on that chart. And we'll talk to you next time.